the series RLC circuit we took to be this and I wrote the differential equation with the capacitor Vc as the desired variable and this Vs steps from 0 to Vp but in general it could be anything okay. We are now looking at a constant input and a parallel RLC uh, we could have this I believe this is the example I took last week as well. Let me just check. And again I will write the differential equation in terms of Vc as the variable okay. So, we will have in the first case this is the differential equation we get okay. Mainly we are now interested in the left hand side of this the right hand side when equated to 0 you get the homogeneous differential equation and the natural response can be obtained from the homogeneous differential equation. And in this case the coefficients will come out to be slightly different in the parallel RLC case. Okay. So, this is what we end up getting again the right hand side is not so important the left hand side it has the same structure as this one these two look similar to each other okay. Now, a general uh, differential equation of the second order will be of the form. I am assuming the homogeneous case okay that is the right hand side is 0. Now, we know that an a differential equation of this type has solutions of the form exponential p t. Now, we know this because the time derivative of exponential p t is also exponential p t times some number okay. So, if you go on differentiating you will go on getting exponential p t and it is quite easy to see that that could potentially satisfy this equation for the right value of p. So, how do we find the right value of p? We substitute exponential p t in the uh, differential equation all the exponential p t's will get cancelled out and we will be left with a polynomial in p which is known as the characteristic equation of this differential equation okay. So, what we get if we do that here if I substitute exponential p t in this. we will get a 2 p square plus a 1 times p plus 1 equals 0 okay. So, all we have to do is the second derivative is replaced by p square first derivative by p and this v c itself by 1 okay. So, clearly this will have uh, 2 solutions. 
there will be two possible values of P that will satisfy this and they are given by P1, P2 are given by the solutions to this quadratic equation which is minus A1 by 2 plus minus this okay a1 square square root of a1 square minus 4 times a2 divided by 2 this comes from the very familiar uh, solution to the quadratic e equation so now again there are uh, three possibilities to this uh, the term under the square root could be positive zero or negative depending on that we will have uh, two real roots uh, complex conjugate roots or two identical real roots okay So, a1 square greater than 4a2 or in other words square root a2 by 2a1 less than 1 or uh, let me put it in another way let me copy this over so what I have done is to write the differential equation with some general uh, coefficients a1 and a2 so that it is not tied to some specific circuit okay previously we got these coefficients in terms of uh, L, C and R, we will do that when we go to the specific circuit but this will tell you that it is not specific to RLC circuit, it will uh, be the case for any circuit that has a second order differential equation describing it okay. We will uh, connect it to the actual coefficients in different circuits okay. So now in this case we have uh, three kinds of solutions one is when a1 square is more than 4a2 this can also be written as square root of a2 by a1 less than half or equivalently a1 by 2 square root of uh, a2 greater than 1 okay. So these are all equivalent statements I hope uh, that is clear this inequality says exactly the same thing as this which says exactly the same thing as that okay. So now in this case we will have two distinct real roots okay that is this term under the square root is positive that means that the square root is a real number that means that both these p1 and p2 will be real numbers which will be different from each other because one comes from a plus sign the other comes from a minus sign. Now what I would like the participants to do is to tell me whether both p1 and p2 will be negative or one will be positive and one will be negative or will both be positive okay. Please look at these numbers and what I will tell you is a1, a2 are both positive okay this we know for a series RLC case A1 was uh, RC and A2 was LC because these are real component values which are positive these numbers will be positive okay. So please tell me if uh, both of these will be positive both will be negative or one positive and one negative. and for this particular case okay
what do you think? Okay, there is a correction to what I wrote here. This is the roots are I should have uh, a2 in the denominator. Okay, uh, thanks for providing the correction. Now, of course, this does not change this inequality in any way. So, please let me know if uh, the roots will be both positive, both negative, or one positive and one negative. So, it should be clear that both the roots will be negative because a1 and a2 are both positive. So, this number is positive sorry this number is negative and this the square root of this if you take plus the square root of this you can see that the second one will be positive but smaller than this negative number. So, the overall result is negative and when you have both minus signs naturally the whole thing will be negative also. Okay. So, the answer is that P1 and P2 will both be negative in this uh, if A1 and A2 are positive. Okay. So, we will have two distinct real roots and both negative. What does it uh, mean uh, for these roots to be negative? It means that exponential Pt if P is negative this means that this response will die out with time. Okay. Exponential p t it decays with time. Okay. So, that is what that is the implication of 
P1 and P2 being negative. Both are negative which means that eventually the natural response will go to 0. Okay. This was the case with the RC circuit and this is also the case with uh, this one uh, the RLC circuit. Okay. I hope it is clear why both the roots are uh, negative. Okay. Uh, when both terms are negative of course it is obvious when the first term this is negative and we take the plus sign here this uh, entire term is smaller than this. So, the overall result is still negative. Okay. Now, these are all things that we evaluated last time. We did it specifically with values of LC and R. Now, I will do it generally with A2 and A1 and show how uh, the two cases of series and uh, parallel RLC are different from each other. Okay. And this case when A1 a1 square equals 4 a2 what this does is to make the term under the square root 0. So, both p1 and p2 will be equal to minus a1 divided by 2 times a2. Okay. And of course, that will be negative because, because we have minus a1 by 2 a2. Okay. And finally, when a1 square is less than 4 a2, in other words square root a2 by a1 is greater than 1, greater than half or a1 by 2 square root a2 is less than 1, we have the term under the square root is negative. So, the square root itself will be an imaginary number. and we will have the two roots to be minus a1 by 2a2 plus j square root 4a2 minus a1 square. I will reverse the sign inside the square root by 2a2 and the other one will be minus a1 by 2a2 minus j square root 4 a 2 minus a 1 square by 2 a 2. Okay. So, more than the exact values of this what you have to notice is we have plus j times some number here minus j times the same number here. The real parts of the two are the same the imaginary parts have opposite signs. So, what we have are a complex conjugate pair of roots. Okay. So, we have three different cases and there is a reason I wrote the same condition in three different ways. This is in terms of coefficients. Here I have defined some parameter less than half and here I have defined some other parameter greater than 1. Okay. The reason to do that is that these parameters this one and this one are some standard parameters that are uh, very widely used. Okay. So, if you write the differential equation like this let me copy over that.
if this is the differential equation a2 being the coefficient of the second derivative a1 the first derivative and 1 is the coefficient of vc this is important then uh, the characteristic equation of this is of this form okay you have to normalize this to 1 that is important okay that is the way we have done it. Then uh, this parameter square root a2 by a1 is known as the quality factor q okay it is usually denoted by q the quality factor and square root a1 by 2 square root a2 is uh, known as xi the damping factor okay. So, these are constants that are uh, used quite commonly to describe a second order system okay. So, square root of a2 by a1 is known as the quality factor and a1 by 2 square root of a2 is known as the damping factor okay. So, clearly you can write the three conditions these conditions in terms of either the quality factor or the damping factor okay. So, the same thing is written as q less than half or xi greater than 1 okay and here the conditions will be opposite okay. So, now uh, We have the series and uh, parallel RLC circuits okay. Let me copy these things over. So, please tell me what is the quality factor of the series RLC circuit. in terms of the component values in terms of r l and c okay please give me the expression for the quality factor based on the definition i just gave you the definition is here this is the definition corresponding to this differential equation so what i would like is the quality factor for the series r l c circuit okay What is the expression for the quality factor?
So, this is A 2, this is A 1 and the coefficient of V c is 1. Like I said, if it is not 1, you have to normalize that by dividing it by dividing the whole thing by that term. Okay. So, the quality factor of the series RLC circuit which is square root A 2 by A 1 is given by 1 by R square root L by C and the damping factor is I is given by R by 2 square root C by L. Okay. I think a couple of you were able to answer this quite easily. It is just a substitution of terms. Okay. So, now what I would like is the quality factor of the parallel RLC. What is the quality factor of the parallel RLC circuit? Yeah, I got a couple of answers to this as well and it turns out the formula is the same as before. It is square root of A2 divided by A1 and that would be R square root C by L. Okay. The damping factor uh, Xi would be uh, 2 by R square root L by C. And also by the way, it is pretty obvious that uh, from these relationships, from these two that the damping factor psi is 1 by 2 times the quality factor and vice versa. Okay. So, the exact uh, damping or quality factor will depend on these coefficients. In both these cases there are L, R and C, but you see that the expression for quality factor in fact is the reciprocal of one another in the two circuits. Okay. So, that is why I defined the quality factor and the damping factor based on the coefficients A2, A1 and 1. This term has to be normalized to 1, then the second order term is A2, the first order term is A1, then the quality factor is square root A2 divided by A1. Okay. Now, depending on the circuit that you have, it may not even have R, L and C. Okay. It can have two capacitors or two inductors and so on. You can uh, find the quality factor or the damping factor. Okay. So, 
uh, especially what I uh, want to emphasize is that the quality factor expression is different for a series RLC circuit and a parallel RLC circuit. Okay? So, do not try to uh, learn any one of these formulas by heart depending on whether it is parallel or series the damping factor will be different. Okay? Now, one sanity check you can use is the following. A series RLC circuit looks like this and I have nulled the source. Okay. And quality factor is given by 1 over R square root L by C. Okay. Now, if R tends to 0, the quality factor tends to infinity. Okay. And if R tends to 0 in the circuit, what we will have is only L and C in parallel with each other. Okay. Now, if I take a parallel RLC circuit, Okay, let me close this and open it again. There is some problem. Okay. If I consider a parallel RLC circuit which is nulled quality factor of this is r square root c by l and if r tends to infinity q tends to infinity. Okay. And in the circuit we will have only L and C in parallel with each other. So, what I want to emphasize here is that when quality factor tends to infinity you will have only L and C in a loop. Okay. So, the quality factor can tend to infinity if R is 0 or R is infinity. If R is 0 in a series RLC circuit, then you will have a single loop of L and C and the quality factor of that is infinity. If you have R equals infinity in a parallel RLC circuit, you will have a single loop of L and C and the quality factor of that is infinity. Okay. So, this is another sanity check that you can use at the circuit level. When the quality factor is infinity, that is let us say you get a certain expression for quality factor and you adjust the resistance value so that uh, that quality factor goes off to infinity. Then in the circuit what should be happening is that you should be left with a single L and single C in a loop. Okay? It should be a lossless loop. And Q equal to infinity means R equals 0 in the series case and R equals infinity in the parallel case. Okay? So, mainly I am emphasizing this over and over because the formulas for quality factor for series and parallel RLC circuits are opposite of each other, but there is nothing contradictory or confusing. There should be nothing confusing about this. It is just that when the quality factor tends to infinity, you should be left with pure L and C in a loop. That happens when the parallel RLC's resistance R is infinity or the series RLC's resistance R is 
0. Okay. I hope that part is clear. Now, let us take the case of uh, quality factor less than half which means the damping factor more than 1 which basically means that A1 square is more than 4A2. Okay. So, in this case P1 and P2 will both be real and negative. Okay. Now, uh, the natural response will be of the form A1 exponential minus P1T plus A2 exponential minus P2. Okay. And the constants A1 and A2 you can adjust using initial conditions. Now qualitatively if you look at these curves exponential minus P1T might be like this. Okay. And exponential minus P2T might be like that. when I plot them versus time. So, the combination A1 exponential minus P1T plus A2 exponential minus uh, P2T okay, it could be of uh, depending on the initial condition I will assume it starts from there it could be of some form like that. Okay. It will be just a combination of exponentials. Now let me take the other case when the quality factor exactly equals half or damping factor equals 1 and A1 square equals 4A2. In this case it turns out that P1 and P2 are real and identical. The natural response it turns out because we have only a single value of P1 that is P1 and P2 are real and identical. The natural response it turns out consists of this form A1 plus A2T times exponential minus P1T. Okay. So, this means P2 equals P1. So, if you say exponential P1T and exponential P2T they will be the same as each other. So, the actual natural response will have A1 plus A2 times T times exponential P1 exponential minus sorry not minus P1 exponential P1T. Okay. I think previously also I perhaps wrote this wrongly it is exponential P1T and exponential P2T okay. not minus. because that minus sign is in the uh, value of P1 itself. Okay. And in this case when uh, the damping factor is 1 or the quality factor is half the natural response will be A1 plus A2T times exponential P1T. Okay. Finally, When the damping factor is less than 1 or A1 square is less than 4A2, P1 and P2 will be a
complex conjugate pair okay so what does that mean the natural response will be of the form first of all p1 and p2 i will write as some real part pr plus or minus j times an imaginary part pi okay so the natural response will be of the form a1 exponential p1t plus a2 exponential p2t which can be written as a1 exponential pr t exponential j p i t and a2 exponential p r t exponential minus j p i t so this part is real and these parts are complex okay so these are complex parts and i will take out the real part this is what the natural response looks like okay now the natural response itself is a real number that is we are talking about a voltage here for instance in case of an rlc circuit the natural response of the voltage vc so what i would like from you is the conditions on these coefficients a1 and a2 so that the natural response is real okay what are the conditions on a1 and a2 so that the natural response is real what are the conditions on a1 and a2 so that the natural response is real
it turns out that because these two are complex conjugates of each other, if a1 and a2 are also complex conjugates of each other, some will be a real number. Okay. So this condition is a2 being complex conjugate of a1. Okay. So in that case, the entire expression is real. Okay. Now the whole thing looks very complicated, but mainly what I want to point out is that A2 is the when A2 is the complex conjugate of A1, and you know that the complex numbers can be described by their magnitude and some phase angle. Okay. Then this whole expression becomes exponential of PR times T times the magnitude of A1 times exponential j phi exponential j p i t plus exponential minus j phi because here we would have got a2 which is the complex conjugate of a1 times exponential j p i t okay so which uh, results in a1 exponential P R times T exponential J P I T plus phi plus exponential minus J P I T plus phi. Okay. You know that also exponential J X plus exponential minus J X is 2 times cos X. So, this sum is 2 times cosine of p i of t plus phi which basically gives us 2 a 1 exponential p r t exponential p i t plus phi. Okay. So, what do we have finally? the entire natural response becomes a product of an exponential and a sinusoid. Okay. So, that is the qualitative difference I was trying to bring about. Okay. There is a question about how to get the uh, previously recorded lectures. If you go to the NPTEL website, you will see that all recorded lectures are available. Okay, So, you can go there and then get all of the lectures. So, now let me just summarize the three cases. The first one is when the quality factor is less than half or damping factor is greater than 1 in terms of the differential equation coefficients a1 square greater than 4a2 and the response is of the form a1 exponential p1 t plus a2 exponential p2 t a1 and a2 you choose from initial conditions 
and this particular uh, uh, condition where the damping factor is high that is damping factor is more than 1 is known as the over damped case and if I plot the natural response qualitatively okay, it will look something like that. Let me plot all of them in the same plot later. And the second case when the quality factor equals half and the damping factor equals 1 or in terms of the coefficients A1 square equals 4A2, this is known as the critically damped case. And in this case, the natural response again has two constants, it is A1 plus A2T exponential P1T because P2 is identical to P1. Okay. And finally, when the quality factor is more than half or the damping factor is less than 1 in terms of the coefficients A1 square smaller than 4A2. This is known as the under damped case and in this case uh, P2 and P1 are complex conjugates of each other and the natural response is turns out of the form some constant exponential of P R T and exponential P I T plus phi. Okay. So, again there are two constants here really there is the constant A 1 and there is this constant phi and these have to be adjusted from initial conditions. Okay. And what are P R and P I? Basically P2 and P1 are this P1 is P R plus J times P I. It will be a complex number that is where the P R and P I come from. Okay. These two uh, constants and these two constants and this or that all of these are determined from initial conditions. Okay. So, I hope this part is clear. I will qualitatively show how these responses look like and why they are called over damped, critically damped and under damped. Okay. I will not go into much more detail about this, but uh, you can try it yourself. I uh, will try to determine A1 and A2 from initial conditions and uh, get the total response. Okay. By the way, let me also describe what happens for uh, the three cases in uh, the two kinds of uh, circuits. Uh, over damped which means Q less than half or damping factor is I more than 1. Okay. And in case of series or you will see this means that basically you have a large resistance. Okay. So, if you work it out based on the formula for quality factor or uh, damping factor this is what you will see. Parallel RLC value of R is small that is when you have over damped. 
and critically damped means q equals half or zeta equals 1 and under damped is when q is more than half or zeta is less than 1 and the value of r is small in a series or lc case or large in the parallel or lc case okay So, let me take an example of uh, some series RLC circuit. Okay. So, there will be a certain initial condition on the capacitor voltage and there will be a certain initial condition on the inductor current okay, which basically can be thought of as initial condition on the derivative of the capacitor voltage okay and from these you can calculate all the responses i will assume the case with vs equal to 0 so then Let me imagine that for some value of R, L and C, the circuit is over damped that is the quality factor is less than half or the damping factor is more than half. Okay. So, I will plot V C versus time starting from some initial condition V C of 0. Okay. So, what you would see is that for a certain uh, initial condition on Vc of 0 and IL of 0, the response may look something like this. Okay. This is a typical response of an over damped case. So, this would be over damped and as you go on reducing the value of r okay let us say for some value of r it is over damped as you go on reducing the value of r at some point it becomes critically damped okay so for that the response tends to uh, look like this okay so this would be critically damped and finally, when it becomes over damped you see that uh, again I think I made a mistake here this should be cosine okay. this should be cosine P i of t plus 5 and because of the presence of this cosine we will have a cosine uh, sinusoidal response which has uh, cycles right which goes alternately between positive and negative values. And because of this exponential PRT, the amplitude of the oscillation goes to 0. Okay. So, what we would see would be something like this. Okay. You will see some oscillations and then it can go off to 0. Okay. These are not to scale. Okay and also the response varies a little bit with the initial conditions, but qualitatively this is what you would see. And this happens in a series RLC circuit as R decreases it goes from being over damped to critically damped to under damped. Okay. Is this fine? If there are any questions I will uh, take them now. Uh, otherwise, we can move on to the next topic.
Then if you want to get the step response of a second order system, you first calculate the steady state response. Okay. This is based on uh, open circuiting all capacitors and short circuiting all inductors. And then you calculate the damping factor or the quality factor and from this you write the general form of the natural response. The total response is natural response plus steady state response or the forced response okay and the constants in the natural response either a1 and a2 or a1 and phi these have to be adjusted from initial conditions. Okay. This is fine. So, this is how the total step response of a second order system would be found. What we will do next is to find out the response of these circuits whether it is RC or RLC to other kinds of time varying waveforms. Okay. Now, we have analyzed them to some extent till now, but we have considered only constant waveforms or steps which are of course varying, but piecewise constants. Now, signals in general can vary in more complicated fashion. So, what we will look at is uh, the response of these signals to sinusoids which is a particular kind of time varying signal. Okay. 
Now we won't go into the details, but it turns out that any signal of any shape can be constructed by combination of sinusoids. Okay, that is by adding up sinusoids of different frequency and phase. Also, now we are dealing with linear circuits. So, if the input is a sum of different sinusoids, then we know that superposition applies. We have to find the response to each of the sinusoids individually and then add up the responses to get the final response to the or the combination of the sinusoids. Okay. So, we can analyze the circuit for sinusoidal inputs with knowing fully well that for any other kind of input, if we know its decomposition into sinusoids, we will be able to tell the response also. Okay. So, that is why you find that most of the time uh, either in uh, analysis or in measurement uh, trans uh, the circuits are uh, characterized using sinusoids. Okay. So, what we will do is we will look at uh, the response to uh, sinusoidal inputs. Now, this can be done by solving the differential equation, but uh, we will take an easier route and show that uh, what the relationships are, show what the relationships are for each element when a sinusoid is applied. Okay. And then uh, from there what we will be able to do is directly from the circuit uh, transform it into uh, transform it in some way so that uh, we can tell what the sinusoidal response is. Okay. Now there is one caveat here if we solve the differential equation we will see that it will have a certain a natural response and a certain force response. Now it turns out that if you have a sinusoidal input the force response is also a sinusoid of the same frequency its amplitude and uh, phase can be different. Okay. Now uh, with the method that I am talking about the natural response will not be computed at all. Okay. Uh, the method I am going to outline where we transform each element R, L and C into something that is appropriate for sinusoidal steady state analysis. It turns out that essentially we will be omitting the natural response completely. So, uh, this will calculate only the steady state or the forced response to sinusoids. But that is still okay, uh, it is still useful enough in practice because there are so many practical situations where you apply a sinusoid to a circuit and you wait for a while for the natural responses to die out and then you look at the output. Okay. So, it is uh, still quite useful in practical context and it is also much much easier than solving the differential equation. So, that is why we do this thing. Okay. And this entire business is known as either uh, sinusoidal steady state analysis or phasor analysis. The reasons for all of these things will become clear later. Okay. We will talk about phasers later. First, I will show the sinusoidal steady state analysis. Okay. So, what is this all about? So, first of all, let me apply a voltage which is just cos omega t across a resistor R. Okay. What is the value of the current I? Please let me know. I apply a sinusoidal voltage cos omega t across a resistor R. What is the value of the current I?
So, clearly a current I is V by R which is cos omega t divided by R. Okay. Now, let us say I apply sin omega t across the same resistance R, this let me call this I1, I1 will be V1 by R, so V1 is cos omega t. V2 is sin omega t. This I2 will again be V2 by R. Okay, we know the VI relationship of a resistor. This is sin omega t by R. Okay. Then uh, now because this is a linear element, okay, superposition applies. That is, I've applied V1, I've got I1. Applied V2, I've got I2. So now if I apply, let's say alpha1 V1 plus alpha2 V2, by linearity I expect the current to be alpha1 I1 plus alpha2. I2. Okay. Now I will choose particular values of alphas, which, uh, as you will see very easily, will uh, become uh, will make it very convenient to analyze circuits. I will choose alpha one to be one, and alpha two to be j, that is square root of minus one. Okay. If I do that. The applied voltage V, which I call let us say V3, will be cos omega t plus j sin omega t, right? Because it is cos omega t times 1 plus sin omega t times j, which of course you know from basics of complex numbers is exponential j omega t, okay. So, if you apply exponential j omega t, the response will of course be I3 which is I1 plus j times I2 which is exponential j omega t divided by R. Okay. Now, there is nothing surprising here. I could have started off with uh, exponential j omega t and said that the uh, current is exponential j omega t divided by r because the current is simply voltage divided by the resistance. But the interesting thing comes when we apply the same thing to capacitors and inductors, right? Because initially we could always analyze resistive circuits somewhat easily, right? Because V and I were uh, proportional to each other and we had so many techniques to uh, analyze even very complicated resistive networks like using uh, nodal analysis and so on, okay? Whereas once we had capacitors or inductors, we ended up with uh, differential equations, which is definitely more difficult than uh, solving algebraic equations. So now uh, this is trivial, but it just illustrates the point. I did it in a convoluted way. Instead of simply saying I will apply exponential j omega t, because then you will not understand the motivation why I did that. I applied cos omega t, sin omega t, and by superposition, I constructed this exponential j omega t. Okay. Now, let us do the same for uh, capacitors and inductors and see what we get. First, let me take a capacitor and apply V1 equals cos omega t to it. And what is the current? I1, 
I1 is C times the time derivative of V1 which is basically minus omega C sin omega T and similarly if V2 is sin omega T that is I apply sin omega T across a capacitor a current I2 will flow okay which is C dV2 by dt which is basically plus omega C cos omega t. Now uh, if I apply a third voltage V3 which is exponential j omega t and remember I do not have to solve for this separately I could uh, I could have solved for this separately but uh, I will first do it uh, individually that is I imagine that this cos omega t and sin omega t are superposed I multiply cos omega t by 1 and sin omega t by j to get exponential j omega t. The whole reason I am doing it this way is because I already told you that we will characterize the circuit with sinusoids. We will use sinusoids to analyze and even in the lab to measure uh, some things about our circuits. So cos omega t and sin omega t are sinusoids and from that I will construct this uh, some complex number exponential j omega t. Now that is an abstract thing which is really a mathematical quantity. I cannot get exponential j omega t in the lab. Okay, but it is still very useful to analyze using that. We will see why. Now I will have this uh, V3 which is exponential j omega t okay, which is basically V1 plus j times V2. Okay. Now the current I3 is I1 plus J times I2 okay, which turns out to be omega C times minus sin omega T plus J cos omega T which you can see can also be written as J omega C times cos omega t plus j sin omega t which is basically j omega c exponential j omega t. Okay. I could also have got this uh, directly I3 which is c time derivative of exponential j omega t which is j omega c exponential j omega t. Okay. Now why did I do all this? The point is the following. First of all exponential j omega t can be thought of as superposition of cos omega t and sin omega t with some multiplying factors. I multiplied cos omega t by 1 and sin omega t by j. Okay. Then uh, the response to exponential j omega t is also a superposition of response to cos omega t and sin omega t. Okay. Now what I am trying to emphasize is that it is the response to cos omega t that I am interested in. I apply cos omega t to some circuit and I want to find what the response is. Now in case of a capacitor I can still find it quite easily because it is very easy to differentiate V1 which is cos omega t. But later we will see the circuits can get quite complicated. Okay. Now what happened? I found this uh, superposed response I3 by superposing this which is j omega c exponential j omega t okay. or I could even differentiate it directly and I would get the same answer naturally. Okay. They have to be consistent. Now the point is that if you look at this thing, right, the applied voltage is exponential j omega t 
and the current if you see it is proportional to exponential j omega t okay. We have some constant it happens to be an imaginary number in this case but the point is it is some constant times exponential j omega t. Now this is not the case when I apply cos omega t when I apply cos omega t the response is sin omega t it is not something times cos omega t okay it looks more complicated I have to get it by differentiation. But if I apply exponential j omega t as shown using both ways that the response is some number times exponential j omega t okay it is proportional to uh, the applied voltage and this happens to be just as in the resistors case okay in, uh, in this case we have I3 to be 1 by R which is the conductance of the resistor times exponential j omega t okay the current is some number times the voltage the capacitor also uh, has a current voltage relationship in the same form if the applied voltage is exponential j omega t okay. So that is what makes it convenient but then what I am interested in is what happens when uh, I apply cos omega t okay. So I, that is the thing that I will apply in the lab so that is what I want to know. So now that is where this uh, viewpoint of superposition helps okay. If you look at this excitation I have formed V1 plus J times V2 and let us say I am interested in the response to cos omega t okay. This is my interest okay. So now uh, I have constructed V3 as superposition of uh, V1 and V2. So naturally I3 the response to V3 is a superposition of this is the response to V1 plus J times the response to V2 okay. Let me in fact rewrite this I will write this as minus omega C sin omega t plus j omega c cos omega t okay. Remember I could get this answer much more easily by simply applying exponential j omega t and doing c d by dt of exponential j omega t. But the point is I want to get back this uh, quantity which is the response to cos omega t. You see that the way this has been constructed v1 plus j times v2 okay the response also will be the response to v1 plus j times the response to v2. Now v1 and v2 are real quantities okay they are cos omega t or sin, sin omega t and response to v1 is a real quantity it is some real voltage in the circuit. Response to v2 is also a real quantity it is some real voltage in the circuit okay. So now this j this uh, multiplier square root of minus 1 helps to keep the two responses separate okay. You see what I am saying V1 is cos omega t, V2 is sin omega t, our superposition was V1 plus J times V2. So the response also will be response to V1 plus J times the response to V2. So the response to V1 will be the real part of the total response, the response to V2 will be the imaginary part of the total response okay. So I can calculate the response to exponential j omega t and take the real part to get a response to cos omega t and if I wanted the response to sin omega t I could take the imaginary part we do not normally do that but uh, uh, we just stick with the real part I will explain why later uh, I mean it is just an easy thing to do okay. So we now have a much easier way of analyzing I will elaborate on this in the next lecture. The reason it is easier is with exponential j omega t the relationship for the capacitor became somewhat like the resistor that is the current is just proportional to the voltage current is the voltage times some number okay instead of being this differential uh, uh, derivative and so on okay. But uh, from that we have to calculate uh, the response to cos omega t and that is also easy okay the real part of that gives the response to cos omega t okay. So from this uh, we will uh, be able to analyze any circuit 
consisting of R, L and C when the applied voltages are sinusoids okay. If there are any questions I will be happy to answer them now otherwise uh, we will meet on Thursday. I think also today there was a lot of lag between uh, uh, what I am saying and what was being received on the net. Hopefully you will be able to watch the recorded lecture and uh, fill up any gaps that may be there, okay. Thank you, I will see you on Thursday.